Thank you, everyone. How, what a delight to get to take part in that free and fair election. <laughs> <laughs> I was really glad you asked about the no's, just to me, you know, in the interest of due diligence. Um, Welcome to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club. It is always such a delight to be here, and I think this is going to be a fascinating conversation. I am Molly Wood. I'm a host and senior editor at Marketplace, uh, and I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Brad Smith, who is president and chief legal officer at Microsoft and also co-author, there's Caroline Ware, yep, right there, uh, of the new book, Tools and Weapons, The Promise and Peril of the Digital Age. This is where it's going to get awkward because I'm going to do the long bio. <laughs> As Microsoft's president, Brad Smith leads a team of more than 1,400 business, legal, and corporate affairs professionals working in 56 countries. I imagine they're somewhat neglected now that you're on book tour. <laughs> no, we, it's called the internet. You can stay connected. <laughs> He uh, has been with Microsoft since 1993, having previously served as general counsel, promoted to president in 2015. He holds a law degree from Columbia University and plays a key role in spearheading the company's work on <gasps> critical issues involving the intersection of technology and society, including cybersecurity, privacy, artificial intelligence, human rights, immigration, philanthropy, and environmental sustainability. So some stuff. Uh, the New York Times has called him a de facto ambassador for the technology industry at large. And Mr. Smith says he operates by one simple core belief, which I think is really what we're going to spend the most of our time on tonight. When your technology changes the world, you bear a responsibility to help address the world you have helped create. So we're going to jump, I think, right into that. To discuss okay. all of this, please welcome Brad Smith. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as promised, I want to start there with this idea of responsibility. Do you think that that is true of everyone in technology now? And do you think that you always felt that way about the products that Microsoft was creating? Uh, first of all, I do think it is true for everyone in technology today. And I, I don't know whether I can say um, I always felt this way, but probably to a significant degree. Uh, yeah, it sort of comes from a, a background of just being civically engaged, uh, you know, from before I, I came to Microsoft. Um, and, you know, if, if there's one aspect that I would highlight, there are two, or there's actually three ways that I see people in technology define the re their responsibility to address the issues around technology. Um, one is to say, um, it's not our responsibility, but the government should do something. Uh, a second is to say, um, if you help create a problem, you have a responsibility to help solve it. Neither of those are the way that Carol Ann and I have worded this. We've said, if you create technology that helps change the world, you have a responsibility to engage and help address the world that you've helped change. Which, and this is the part that I think is important, Mm -hmm. means even if your technology isn't part of the problem, I think you have an, a responsibility and you definitely have an opportunity to ask whether you can be part of the solution. And that's really part of what we are hoping in the tech sector to encourage. It's one thing to say, oh, that company is, is, has created this problem. That company has to go do something about it. We say no. Technology has created this, and maybe that company has done something more, but we can help be part of the solution even if we're not at that company. Um, I'm gonna, I want to talk about the book for a little bit, mm -hmm. which seems fair. Um, Thank you. <laughs> why? So, you know, tools and, and weapons, the perils and the promise, and it, it seems like you really are trying to, in the book, it, it takes a very long historical view of the developments that got us to a certain point in technology um, and it seems like maybe set some context for mm -hmm. around how it's used. How, how balanced should we be when we read this? Because it's easy to go. I mean, we're at a point now where we're just talking about the weapon part. There are people who've joked that we actually should have called it weapons and tools instead of tools and weapons <laughs> because it, in all fairness, it probably does talk about the, the challenges, the problems, you know, more than the great things that technology has enabled. And we love the great things that technology has enabled, but if anything, we think that the world today is focused on the, the problems. Um, we, you know, we point out that any tool can be a weapon. The analogy we use is you can use a broom to sweep 
the floor, you can use a broom to hit somebody over the head. The more powerful the tool, the more powerful the, the weapon. This is powerful stuff, mm -hmm. and it is being weaponized in a wide variety of ways. We think it's important, especially in a place like San Francisco, in the heart of technology, to think about both sides of that. We also think that there's a lot to learn from history. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, we sort of feel the tech sector is sometimes challenged by is this very positive, relentless focus on the future. It is a great thing to have. But it really helps if you go into the future with some perspective from the past. Um, there's a saying that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Hmm. And it does. Um, that's why we use a, a number of historical stories in our book to frame the issues that we're confronting today. We think that there are powerful insights, maybe not complete roadmaps, but insights to be drawn from history that can help us understand the issues that we're facing today and can help us bring together people to come together around some new solutions. Give us some examples, because I think, you know, there's some really interesting, you really talk about, for example, how the Edward Snowden papers were a, a real start of a schism between tech and the government. There's also, you know, the, the sort of how we got privacy laws in California. Like, give us some of those. Well, let me start with the examples. one that, you know, we've actually found, I think, in some ways, uh, you know, when we hear from people who, who've read the book come away and they say, wow, I really enjoyed that story among uh, all of them, perhaps the most. And it's the story of the demise of the horse as the foundation for the American economy in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and you know, the first half of the 20th century was reshaped by one invention more than any other. It was the combustion engine. Uh, you know, and obviously, it, it, it wasn't just the car. I mean, it was the tractor on farms. It was trucks. It was airplanes. All of that was made possible by the combustion engine. And the, the story we, the, that we start that chapter with mm -hmm. uh, was in a January day in New York in 1922. It was the last day that there was a fire wagon pulled by horses in the streets of New York. Uh, and it was a, a, a change of culture among many other things. And you know, what is interesting is there was a McKinsey uh, report a few years ago that said that between 1910 and 1950, the transition from the horse to the automobile created seven times as many jobs as it destroyed. Great, you'd say. That's fantastic. But what we highlight in our book is the story of how in 1932, the height of the Great Depression, there was a fascinating report by the US Census Bureau. And it said, you know, one of the fundamental reasons that the US is having the biggest depression in its history is because of the demise of the horse. And you go, like, hmm. how could that be? But it was very well documented with an enormous amount of data. And basically, the horse population in the country had declined by a third between 1920 and 1930. As it declined, farmers said, you know what? We're not going to grow as much hay. Horses love hay. People do not love hay. We're shifting our crops to crops that people will buy. So they moved away from oats, from hay, from corn to some degree. They planted more tobacco. They planted more cotton. They planted more wheat. What happened? Because of the inelasticity of prices for agricultural goods, the prices of those goods collapsed. And as the prices collapsed, the income of farmers collapsed. They couldn't repay their loans to the rural banks. The rural banks couldn't repay their loans to the urban banks. The entire financial sector of the nation collapsed, and we had the Great Depression. So, you know, it's a story of economic history, but it's really a story about technology. The combustion engine led to the demise of the horse. Mm -hmm. And our fundamental point is today, Let's look ahead to the next three decades. Let's think about what life will be like in the year 2050. In all probability, artificial intelligence, AI, will be as big and impactful in this century as the combustion wa engine was a century ago. So then let's think about the economic impact and lessons that can be gleaned, and there are many. And now let's think about AI and what the future means 
with that perspective in mind. I feel like it's also a cautionary tale for me to not write the demise of the horse story, to write the, <laughs> let's talk about 30 years from now when the, we're past that. Um, you have three chapters devoted to AI. Yeah. They cover ethics, facial recognition, and the workforce. Give us a little bit of a tour through those. I mean, the ethics, I think, is the conversation we're happening we're having now. Yeah. Um, what what should a computer do? What are the historical lessons there? What what should we be drawing from that chapter? Well, we wrote these three chapters in the, as a sequence, you know, for a reason. We wanted to start by frankly making the advances in AI more accessible to people. I mean, look, if you work for a tech company and you, you know you have a PhD in data science you're not going to read our chapter and say, oh, now I understand how AI works. You knew that before you opened the book. But most of us don't have a PhD in data science. So we wanted to bring to life why AI is exploding now and how. We then wanted to bring to life the ethical issues that need to be addressed and, and how we operationalize these, and again, put these in historical context. We then wanted to address what we regard as the real first issue that is at the front line of AI and ethics. It is facial recognition. One of the fascinating things to me, <clears throat> and we share this story in the book, was when we came out, well, I published a, a blog for Microsoft in July of 2018, 17 months ago. And we said, this facial recognition issue is really challenging and we're gonna need laws to regulate it. And there were, a number of people in Silicon Valley, as we share in the book, who said, why are you people at Microsoft talking about this? This is not a problem. Nobody is worried about this. Okay, here we are in the city of San Francisco. Less than a year after we wrote that, city council passed an ordinance to prohibit the public sector use of facial recognition. It actually is a really important issue because as the world grapples with this, we will learn about how we need to grapple with other ethical issues in the future. And then ultimately, we've got to look at beyond the ethical issues to the impact on jobs, the impact of the, on the workforce, the impact of the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is, was show how these things ultimately interconnect and in a similar vein, ask ourselves what are some of the lessons of history that are applicable to each of these. Before I keep talking about the book, though, I have to ask you, it, you're both currently at Microsoft, which, you know, we were talking a little backstage about incentives. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of one thing to lay out this historical review, like it, you describe it, and it sounds like an academic book, but it is a book written by someone who's actively engaged in commercializing many of the technologies that are in this book. How do you square that circle? Well, it's a great question, and, and, and I have to admit, one of the, you know, we, Neither of us had ever written a book separately or together before. So, you know, we're first-time authors, and like anything you do for the first time, you sort of discover, oh, that's what this world is like. Uh, and, you know, what you it's realize... from what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, the first thing you, rec you, you learn is, like, you know, there's so many books that everybody tries to put yours in a pigeonhole. And <clears throat> is this a book about what it's like to face these issues in a day-to-day -day experience at Microsoft? Yes. Is this a book that asks what can we learn from history you know, in what we hope is a narrative, engaging, storytelling way to think about the future? Yes. Oh, wait a second. There's only one pigeonhole. Where do we put this? <laughs> um, but I actually think it's fantastic for us because we work on these issues every single day. And the truth of the matter is what I've tried to bring and what Carol Ann and I do, because we work together on these issues at the company, is we actually try to bring a broad perspective to the company's approach to them. And yeah, I feel so fortunate you know, to work with and for a CEO in Satya Nadella who embraces this kind of breadth of perspective and is not just willing, but encouraging of having us as a company try to step back. And, and believe me, we're not gonna get everything right. Nobody does. But let's try to think broadly before we dive in and, and, and think narrowly. So the book both reflects what we try to do every day, and what you also realize is when you write a book, it actually forces you to think. You actually have to think deeply so the book was a tool that enabled us to refine our thoughts and share them in the book 
and then bring them back to the workplace. Well, in that case, then we're going to try to extract some takeaways because that yeah. is what <laughs> we will try to pigeonhole yeah. a little bit. Um, one is that there are essentially 15 separate issues in this book that are pretty far ranging from protecting democracy to cybersecurity to digital diplomacy to consumer privacy to rural broadband to the talent gap in technology. If you had to look at this list of, of tools and weapons, where do you think that we should if you had to pick something, where should we put our, our focus? What's the most potentially weapony? Well, the first thing I would say is we should uh, really focus on what it means to defend a democracy in the world today. Uh, we're going into a presidential election year, all the more reason to think about that. Um, I'll just start with one of the historical lessons that we think really speaks to where we are today. Uh, interestingly, in the very first administration, in this country, when George Washington was president, one of the crises he needed to grapple with was an effort by the French government to disrupt our dis democracy. They sent an ambassador here. His name was Charles Genet. He came with diplomatic instructions to do whatever it took to get the United States to side with France in its war with England. His diplomatic instructions gave him the authority to try to organize a popular uprising, even to overthrow the US government, if that's what it took. So even though the capital was in Philadelphia, Genet landed in Charleston, South Carolina, and he sort of paraded up the East Coast, organizing these popular protests. They really inflamed the Eastern seaboard at the time. Interestingly, though, Despite the enormous discord in Washington's cabinet, most especially between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, they all came together and said, look, this cannot stand. And so the cabinet united behind Washington and they demanded Genet's recall to France. And when Washington wrote his farewell address in his last six months as president, something interestingly no American president did again until Dwight Eisenhower did it in 1961. He talked about the threats to democracy. And he said, a democracy is more susceptible to foreign threats than any other type of government. And he spoke and wrote from experience. So now it's 2019, why are we talking about you know, something that was written in the 1790s? Because of technology. You know, the argument we advance in the book is in part from say the, the, the 50s through you know, 2010, technology was really regarded as something that would spread democracy. You know, and it did, whether it was the radio or television or the fax machine, it brought information into Central and Eastern Europe and into the Soviet Union. But with the advent of digital technology, the tables have turned. So we've seen the hacking of candidates and the leaking of their emails. We saw it in the US, we've seen it in France. You know, we uh, have seen this, these probes into voting systems. Uh, we have seen massive disinformation campaigns launched from one country above all else, Russia, but we're seeing it now from Iran. Uh, and this is a threat. And you know, we need to unite the country. And this is what is so interesting to us. Oh my gosh, think about how disunited we are. You know, even compared to when we wrote this book, we are so disunited as a nation around this issue of foreign interference with our democracy. But just think about what it will mean if we wake up in November of 2020 and we read that one person's been elected president by winning in three states by small margins, and then a week later it becomes clear that the voter rolls were tampered with, mm -hmm. or the voting results were tampered with. Just think about what that would mean to the legitimacy of our government. The time to come together to address this problem, as difficult as it is, is before the election, not after. Mm -hmm. And we have to, I think, be inspired to some degree about, by what created this country in the first place. Hmm. Do you think we are? Not enough. Yeah. Not enough. It's, you know, just read the news. We're not thinking about these things with the breadth of perspective that we will need to bring to bear if we're gonna stay united as a nation. Well, and it's, 
I know, right? Agreed. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you really relate those issues to lots of these technologies, to cybersecurity, yeah. to social media, to AI, you know, to deep fakes. Like there's sort of all of these technological tools that have created this problem. Talk about the solution side of things because Unity is still feeling pretty far off. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I would focus on two areas. You know, one is in the cybersecurity space. You know, where, you know, we've been advocates, I've been an advocate for what we call a digital Geneva Convention. And you might ask, what is that? It's basically a pretty straightforward concept at a certain level. Our point is, after the end of World War II, the governments of the world, every one of them, came together in Geneva, Switzerland in 1949 and committed in the Fourth Gener Geneva Convention that they would protect civilians even in a time of war. And our point is, look at what's happening around the world. Look at these nation-state cyber attacks. We have governments attacking civilians in what is a time of peace. We've got to mobilize the world to put in place stronger rules to protect civilians, hospitals, schools, voting, the electorate, you know, in certainly a time of peace. And that requires multilateral diplomacy, it actually requires multi-stakeholder action. And, and we describe some of the stories, real initiatives where we believe progress is, is being made. So yeah, that is one major part of, of you know, sort of technology and, and actually global action that we believe is needed. And then we do take on, as, as you described, you know, the issues of AI and, and ethics. And you know, I think one of the things that's just really interesting to reflect upon is that in the history of humanity, all of us, we are the first generation that will create machines that can make decisions that previously were made only by humans. So it, it's up to us in the first instance to decide what kind of decisions we want machines to make, what kinds of principles we want machines to use as they make these decisions. And we should recognize that the stakes are high because if we don't think this through, every generation that comes after us is gonna to have to dig themselves out of the hole that we will have dug for them. Mm -hmm. And so you know, we try to put that in some historical perspective as well. Um, another big through line in the book is the relationship with government mm -hmm. on some level, whether it is Microsoft's own relationship with government, uh, which we will get to later, um, or you know, historical precedent, what regulation could and should look like. How, first of all, how weird is it for you to navigate those relationships now, but what do you think that it has to look like? When, when companies the size of Microsoft have, you know, borderless products and almost as much power as a nation state, what do those relationships look like? Well, interestingly, you know, if you look at the history of technology since, say, 1850, no technology has gone as unregulated for as long as digital technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're in the fifth or sixth decade of all of this. And you know, our point is when you look around the country, look around the world, mostly we live in a world where there is a healthy market, but a healthy market that exists on a foundation of what I would call a reasonable amount of regulation. You go to the grocery store, you pick up any product and you're gonna see a nutrition label that is easy for you to understand because there's a regulation about food products. You go over to the pharmacy section and you don't actually ask yourself, I wonder if this drug is safe because the Food and Drug Administration has put it on the market only after testing it and saying that it is. When you leave the grocery store, if you get in your car or a taxi or an Uber, you have some level of confidence in the safety of that automobile, its seatbelt, its airbag, because we have safety standards for cars. And if you take that car to the airport and get on an airplane, that too has safety standards. All of these are part of our daily life and there's regulation. There is room for healthy, balanced, thoughtful regulation for these technologies that are impacting our lives and our societies as much as these other products. And so we should, I think, think hard and even embrace the role and the need for the right kind of regulation. Ask ourselves why we haven't seen it yet. Ask ourselves what it will take to create it. And I think you quite rightly frame it 
in the way that it needs to be addressed because the planet has become so global, because digital technology is inherently, perhaps even uniquely global, we can't rely on governments to do what they've always done and just you know, regulate these on territorial lines. It won't work the way it did for railroads because these things don't stop at the water's edge. I mean, one of the things that comes up when a company calls for regulation at this point is, is some cynicism. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, sure, but regulatory capture could be the name of that game. Or maybe you want to write the regulations or have the, the federal privacy laws be voluntary in terms of compliance. Um, but that gets even more so when you're on the global stage. Like, who's, you know, whose regulation is reasonable? How... how what do you even do? Where, where do you even start? Geopolitical challenges are part of your charter. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, charter. first of all, I start with the premise that I, I, you know, cynicism is not healthy, but skepticism is. No, I think that there is a healthy skepticism whenever anybody starts advocating for anything. It's like, okay, what do you really want? And why do you want it? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the first questions that people should ask, especially when anybody like me turns up from a company, especially a big company, is to ask a few questions. First, are you prepared to not only endorse regulation, but actually sign up for some self-regulation as well? Because I do think in the absence of that, especially in the day of such gridlock, this just becomes a way of potentially just pushing responsibility off to someone else who can't actually act on it which is why in December of 2018, just 12 months ago, when the day we advocated for a specific legislative proposal on facial recognition, we said we would within 30 days start to apply those principles to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we need to do and that's what we try to, to do. So that's the first question you should ask. The second question you should ask is, okay, wait a minute, let's talk about what regulation you're proposing. Is any of it going to apply to you? Because in the realm of facial recognition, there are companies who put out proposals. Some apply to ourselves and others, including governments, and that's what our proposal does. I can say there's other companies, if you read their proposals, it's, they're fascinating. They don't have to do anything to comply with them. It puts the entire burden on someone else. That's where maybe skepticism should become cynicism. And then I think the, 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 the third question you should ask is, in my view, this is just our view, it's right, I think, for people to use their voice. It's good for us to speak as corporate citizens. We actually understand the issues, but we should commit to do it with a level of transparency. Mm -hmm. And I feel this is true at the global, the national, the state, and local level. It's why, you know, frankly, it's been great to be able to, you know, have things like blogs. And it's why we've said, hey, we're going to be in the state capitol. We're going to be advocating for this. But before we even go with this legislative session starting, we're going to spell out publicly what we believe in and what we're going to encourage. And I don't think that should dispel every concern that people might have. But I think if you ask those three questions, it gives you a, a foundation to ask and evaluate you know, how you should feel about what companies are doing. As we do start to have this conversation about regulation, and it seems like we're still in the conversation stage, yeah. do you think increasingly, given the size and power of the companies at play here, it's actually irresponsible to continue to not have... I mean, is it like driving cars with no seatbelts? Well... What, what do you mean? Is it to not have to have you know this digital economy be largely unregulated? unregulated. No, I I mean the, the basic argument in our book is th that era needs to end. This technology is too powerful. It is too ubiquitous. It is reshaping every community and every country around the world to such a degree that the public interest needs to be taken into account. And this technology does need to be governed by the rule of law. You know, it's interesting because, you know, we live in a world where people's reactions oftentimes varies based on the vocabulary one uses. You know, if, if I say this technology needs to be regulated, there are many places, especially, in, I'll say, other parts of the country, where people say, wait a second, I don't like regulation. 
but let me put it a different way. We live in a country where no one should be above the law. No company should be above the law. No product or technology should be above the law. But without law, <laughs> that is the reality. And you know, as we have this conversation uh, around the country, we are trying to put this in that perspective. The issues are so profound. The impact on people's fundamental human rights is significant. It's reshaping the economy. It is so powerful. It shouldn't be above the rule of law. So we need law. Um, I feel like I should point out again, and this went by quickly in your bio, that you've been at Microsoft since 1993. So you speak as a veteran mm -hmm. of a decade-long battle with the United States Department of Justice over Microsoft's size and power. Really the only, you know, the only tech company in modern memory to have gone through this. Um, and yet here you sit with this message. Do you think that your younger compatriots at, at competing companies feel the same way? Well, it's a big industry. It's a diverse industry. Lots of people have different I mean points Mark of Zuckerberg. View. But yeah. <laughs> I do, yeah. yeah Just gonna no. go ahead and put a fine point on that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's like, the, the reality is, look, I mean, you know, we went through an incredibly painful experience as yep. a company. And, you know, we, as you and I were chatting before, you know, I often find when I talk to groups, you know, there are, I figure, three types of individuals for lots of good reasons. People who know and remember that Microsoft is the one company that actually had a court order to break it up. People who knew but have forgotten, and people that never knew in the first place. But we did. You know, the United States Department of Justice and 20 state attorneys general sought and obtained from a federal court in Washington, D.C. in order to divide Microsoft in half. Okay. That is the quintessential definition of an existential crisis for a company. Will it be permitted to continue to live in, in its present form? Now, we ultimately persuaded an appeals court to reverse that, but the appeals court also found against Microsoft on the basis of 12 different acts that the company had engaged in that there had been a violation of the antitrust laws. And because of that, there ensued a settlement discussion a settlement agreement, a consent order, that in effect regulated the Windows operating system for more than a decade. And I was part of the company in the run-up to that, and then I became the general counsel basically the year that that started to go into effect, and I spent eight years really what I would characterize as negotiating peace treaties. Some of them were with governments around the world, and they took a long time, especially in Europe. Some of them, many of them, were with other tech companies, especially in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so we lived through all of that, and I always say, you know, it's a lot easier to learn from other people's mistakes than from your own. So people should learn from our mistakes. We made plenty. And the good news from my perspective is, well, we at least learned from our own mistakes, too. Mm -hmm. And we learned that you have to get along, that you have to understand why people are concerned about you. You have to be willing to compromise. And I think those lessons are applicable to many of the issues and the companies in the tech sector today, including ourselves. You know, the last thing I would do is say, hey, guess what, we're done, because we're successful today. And we're gonna have to continue to grapple with these issues as well. If the kind of underlying thesis of the book, though, is pattern recognition, mm -hmm. and you look at what you see at Facebook or Amazon or Apple, anybody who is the subject of this, or Google, the subject of this antitrust conversation, do you say to yourself, I know where this is going and I see why? There are days when I see elements of that. Uh, you know, th th this industry is changing. Uh, you know, people are awakening, I think, to the issues and their importance and the need to assume responsibility. Um, you know, I have huge empathy for anybody who is having to go through today what we had to go through because I know how hard it is. And I know that you don't get from here to where you need to go in a day. 
um, you know, y y it takes time for it to sink in. Uh, it takes time to come to terms with the fact that as painful as a certain compromise may sound, there is always life after it. And it can be a good life, as it you know, became ultimately I believe Microsoft for, for Microsoft. Be, uh, still be the most valuable company in the world, depending on the day. So yeah, yeah, no, I mean, fine. to me, the part of it is, you know, it, it was incredibly painful. And, and, and we had dark days afterwards, too, not just going through it. Um, but out of the learning, I think we also created part, only a part, of the foundation for what did become, I view, as the renaissance of our company. So uh, I, I see this uh, unfolding, and, and I think you know, part of what we'll experience is certain issues that will be especially pressing for certain companies. But I also think that we're going to see technology as a sector regulated, not just antitrust actions against individual companies. And there may be sectoral regulation that will focus more on certain business models or practices than others. But one thing I always point out in Microsoft is when the 1930s came and Congress enacted banking laws, they didn't create an exception for the banks they liked. They applied to all banks. And that is coming, in my view. It'll come in Europe probably more quickly than in the United States. And it therefore is really incumbent upon all of us, I think, to think hard about what this means, what are good solutions, let's advocate for things that we think will solve problems, but in a way that preserves the innovations that, that, that we're passionate about. But let's recognize the change is coming. Banks also still doing fine, we should point out. <laughs> Most the of same. them, yes. Didn't seem to put a yeah. damper on that business. Um, Let's talk about innovation yeah. and the path dependencies that were created by that 10-year battle, which Bill Gates has referred to as the lost decade. Um, when you think about that time and then you look at the tech industry now, you look at Google's dominance in search and Facebook's dominance in social media and Apple's dominance in phones. Do you ever have a moment where you think we could have done all of that? I never have a moment where I think we could have done, done all of that because the nature of life is you can never anticipate everything and you can never be equally good at everything, even if that's your aspiration and it's a fine and even laudable aspiration to have. Um, but I do think that we might have done some things better than we did if we hadn't gone through or were continuing to go through the issues that we had to deal with. And the other, I, I always find, especially when I come to Silicon Valley and talk about like, you know, this period of time, I then get some tweets from former Microsoft employees or executives and say, no, 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 I saw it differently. And their view is at least as good as mine. Um, but it, it, to me, the, the, one of our directors at the time you know, talked about the prolonged antitrust issues we were dealing with. And these antitrust issues always take a really long time. That's the real lesson from history. And what he talked about was the opportunity cost, and that is huge. You know, what it means to have executives of companies preparing for depositions and preparing to testify on Capitol Hill rather than sitting and thinking, wow, you know, what if we could do this with our products? What if the industry changes in that way? You know, so, you know, there are certain things that we missed, like search. Sort of missed that one. <laughs> You know, what the touch interface could do for a phone. You know, the iPhone was launched in 2007. You know, in 2006, who had the most popular smartphone on the market? Well, it actually was that company up in Seattle that I worked for. We just never thought that, hey, touch could actually make this product a whole lot better than it is right now. So, you know, we missed certain things. No one can sit here and say, oh, but for that issue that we were dealing with, we would have seen it, because that's just not the way life is. Mm -hmm. But I do think the more opportunity you have to look, the more likely you are to see. Right. Uh, and the more you're focused on you know, grappling with one set of challenges, the less intellectual room you have to think as broadly as you would like. And I think that is a really important lesson, even for you know, technology leaders of other companies to think about today. Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> just, uh, <Yeah. laughs> we'll just keep coming back to that. 
Um, but do you think that that is happening now at those companies, the, this sort of cohort of companies that really are being investigated, that are spending a lot of time talking with regulators, whether they wanted to or not? Do you think that some innovation is being hampered? I don't know, for good or for ill. I don't know if some innovation is being hampered because I, you know, look, I can't. It's, it's, it's another one of these great hypotheses. You know, what would be, they be doing if they weren't doing this? Mm -hmm. um, look, every day I think people are getting um, smarter, wiser, broader in their thinking. Um, you know, are we as an industry moving as fast as we need to move to think about the broad issues of the world? No. We need to move faster. We need to be broader in our perspective. And I quite deliberatively use the word we, because again, this is for all of us, because we're in one industry together, and we are a, you know, a, a successful company as well. We all need to think about how we can get smarter tomorrow, and, and, and not just smarter in the narrow way that we might have defined success a decade ago, or even five years ago. We need to keep getting smarter in how we're acknowledging and then addressing the concerns that people have. Do you think those concerns are always fair? You know, I, does it really matter? <laughs> That's the real question. Yeah. I mean, I find there, you know, there are two things I, I find all the time. Yeah, I, we were, I was at the Supreme Court three weeks ago. You know, we were the one company that was a plaintiff in the DACA lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, you know, some people ask me all the time, are you optimistic or pessimistic about your, whether you're going to win that case? I'm like, well, does it really matter? Because it doesn't, gonna, it's not going to change the outcome. All I really need to do is be thinking, how are we going to be prepared for victory? How are we going to be, be, be prepared for defeat? In the same way, oh my gosh, the number of times at Microsoft in the 1990s or the 2000s, you know, there would be this enormous emotion. This doesn't feel fair. Who cares? It doesn't matter. You have to look the problems in their face and you just have to find a way to solve them. And the emotion that goes into objecting to the unfairness of the world doesn't actually help. In fact, I would argue that emotion mostly doesn't help. What you need is energy, inspiration and determination. So, you know, all the time, people ask me, are you an optimist or a pessimist? I said, I don't, it doesn't matter. I'm just determined. That's what we need to be, determined to solve the problems that confront us. Is it ever weird, and I say this as someone who's been covering Microsoft for a long time, to, like, not be the big evil anymore? <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I remember a time when it was like, oh, Microsoft. Yeah, no. Those days are kind of over now. What you really realize, and I think this, you know, the, you know, I, I, what I try to do, look, I'll put it in the context of our stock price. I joined in 1993. From 1993 to you know, the year 2000 or so, the stock went up every year. From like, then it crashed, you know, it was cut in half. Uh, and then from 2001 to 2013, you know, for 12 years, it was flat. Our profits tripled. The stock price was always like $25. It was like, you know, like a fixed price instrument. <laughs> if, you were at, if you joined Microsoft in 2002 and you were there for a decade, you're like, oh, this is like this thing that never changes price. How interesting. And then from 2013 to 2019 today, it has steadily gone up. And you know, now we have employees who've been here with us for five years. And, and most I say, you know what, this is great. You should enjoy this. <laughs> you should enjoy this, but appreciate that life is a little bit like a roller coaster. There are days when, you know, it's exhilarating. Enjoy that moment for what it is and appreciate that it doesn't last forever. There are days when life is hard every morning. It's hard to get up. Be determined. Those days will end too. But mostly recognize that if you're lucky enough to live long, you're going to live through good times and bad and put it all in perspective. Um, and, and so I guess to say, I put, I, I'm very happy that people don't look at us the way they did in 1999 because I was there. And I know that today, you know, we'll, we'll have challenging days just like everybody. I was going to say, you must be like a little bit happy. I am a little bit happy. Yes. <laughs> um, 
I have just been informed that there was like a giant stack of audience questions. My apologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for doing those. Um, the other thing that I want to ask before I get to those, although I probably should hurry up. Guys, you got to type these. Is, <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. Is, um, and actually, this question is directly related, is, is to the idea of your role as a company in public discourse, in politics, in activism. You know, you talk about being a plaintiff in the DACA case, but you also have employees internally saying, you shouldn't have signed the JEDI contract, or you shouldn't be developing products that make it easier uh, to extract oil and gas. How do you walk that line, you know, in terms of being a company with a political yeah. position, but also having employees, and that's to that gets to this question, internally, who are wanting to, to change the direction, who are emboldened by that great stock price? Well, the, there, there's sort of two sides, uh, maybe the same coin, or at least related coins. Um, the, the first thing is we really do try to be uh, thoughtful and principled in deciding what issues we'll speak out on. And, you know, in effect, we say if it's going to affect our customers and their use of our technology, then we think it's an appropriate public issue to address. Surveillance, privacy, cybersecurity all fit into that category. If it affects our employees and their ability to work or to live in the communities where we employ them, we uh, think those are legitimate issues to address. Um, hence immigration or you know, marriage equality. Uh, you know, we, we, we took on DACA. We have 66 DACA registrants among our employees. Or if it's going to address, uh, impact our business you know, in a significant way. If it doesn't impact any of those three things, uh, yeah, then we're hard pressed to say, gee, that's something that we should speak out on because we don't think that you know, leading a company is a license to just take whatever we happen to think as individuals and espouse them on behalf of, of Microsoft as a company. So that's the way we think about that. And, and then just maybe to start to talk about the employee activism issue. Mm -hmm. We talk about this all the time inside the company. Um, Satya and I uh, and the others on the senior leadership team do. It is so interesting. You know, the, the number one thing we start with is it is so different to lead a tech company in 2019 from even 2015. It's just remarkable how much it has changed. And so you might first ask, well, what are you talking about? What's changed and why? Well, th there's a few things that have really come together. First, look, we are, we're, we're living in, a, in an enormously contentious time when at least in tech companies on the West Coast, employees do not have the same level of confidence in the government leaders that they did four years ago. That's plummeted, and you see it in polls. Second, what you see across this country, and even globally, is actually people who work for companies have much higher confidence in their employer, and they're really passionate about what their employer stands for in, in, in a way that, you know, frankly, people in not just generations, but even five or 10 years ago were not. And interestingly, what they're really passionate about is not what motivated employees to unionize in the last century. You know, how much are we paid? What are our benefits? It's what does our employer stand for mm -hmm. on the public issues that we care about? And then the third thing that is different, it's a generational shift, is that people, I'll say in their 20s, their early 30s, they expect to be heard. It doesn't matter if they work at a company with 150,000 employees, which is what Microsoft has today. They expect the people who lead the company to listen to them. And we do, we need to, because they are the most important thing we have for our future. But at the same time, what we've realized is, you know, there is no handbook that tells any of us how to be leaders of a company in this environment. Mm -hmm. So we're all having to really think it through. And for us, what we've really tried to say is, you know what, we want to listen. We really want to understand the problems that are concerning people, because even if we don't agree on the solutions, there's a pretty good chance that we'll have a common view of the problems. We want to be principled, so we always try to define principles as to how we uh, will address this, and we need to have a lot of communication. 
both to listen and to speak, to share where we're going. Um, and we feel generally good about how we're addressing these issues today, and I'd be the first to say, we have to keep changing because the climate, the expectations of employees keeps changing. And, and more than anything else, what we bring to work every day is this sense of, this is a fascinating issue to work on because we have so much to learn and keep learning, and it's not an easy thing to really work through. Um, these questions are fantastic, and several are typed, so I am just going <laughs> to plow. <laughs> Good job. Uh, I'm going to plow through these sort of okay. lightning rounds I'll try style to be because fast. they're really super interesting. Uh, what do you think of, this is not my fault, this is someone else's question. What do you think of Facebook refusing to edit ads that may contain lies versus Twitter, who will no longer allow political ads, and I'll add Google, who is now saying you cannot target political advertising? I generally think that we have to move to an environment where we have more restrictions on political ads. Um, you know, we early on said we weren't gonna have political ads on, on Bing, for example, and obviously that didn't have the economic implications. I wish it did, uh, you know, <laughs> but I think we would have said the same thing either way. Um, you know, I, I, I do believe that democracy would be best served if there were restrictions on targeting uh, to some degree, I think it's one thing to say, you know, we want to serve, you know, something to everybody in a particular zip code. But I think when you look at the precision of targeting today, uh, I think it's actually um, harmful to our democracy mm -hmm. because it is just you're going too far in creating different cyber tribes, if you will, where people are not seeing the same information. And I think we should recognize that actually one of the ingredients to a healthy democracy is that we are all generally exposed to the same information and then can debate and can discuss it together. And so I think those of us in the tech sector need to step back and ask ourselves whether we're actually undermining the democracy that has given us life. And I, I think that when we're talking about you know, things like, I don't think we should go too far in trying to determine what is true or false, because I, I, I don't think that's you know, something that anybody can can do with objective precision. But I think we can do more to share information, and we should, about who's speaking. You know, we all listen to political ads on the radio or TV, and we hear these funny things at the end where somebody speaks really fast and says who paid for it, but you know who paid for it. And I think there's room to bring that kind uh, of principle, uh, you know, to social media. And, and, and I'll, I'll say, you know, I, if there's one thing I just don't, understand, I don't agree with, and we didn't do with the LinkedIn service that Microsoft owns. You know, when somebody took a video of Nancy Pelosi and, sh and slowed it down with the obvious intent to either deceive or, you know, I'll just say, you know, demean in a way that clearly was not true, it was no longer an accurate video, I think the right thing to do is say, no, we don't want to give that display on our platform. So, you know, but I think the overarching principle is we exist because we were born as companies in a democracy. It is great to serve the world. It is great to be in an economic sector that is so lucrative. But my gosh, we better make sure that we protect the democracy that gave us life because it is far more important than what we do or who we are. I really, I really like where I'm going to go next from that, okay. which is, what are your thoughts on blockchain versus the cloud? Oh, that's, <laughs> it is hard for me to We'd be We'd like another passionate. 65 minutes on the clock, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's, I, I'm a little surprised to say blockchain versus the cloud because I actually think all these technologies come together. Yeah. You know, look, the, the, I'll just say two quick things. The cloud has been perhaps the single most important technological development of the decade that's about to end. And the cloud will continue to grow in importance in the decade ahead. But the cloud has been so important because it's been both a technological development and an economic development. Because it has given access on a, an operational basis to previously what were large capital expenses. So people can access the most sophisticated, newest you know, computing and storage and just pay for what they needed. 
And blockchain is an incredible technology that can do so much good for the world in conjunction with the cloud and other technologies. And if we use it well, that and other things, we should make a significant dent in corruption around the world over the next decade. Um, you know, we, 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 we can use it to unleash, you know, many forces for good. But I see these two things being used together, not one versus the other necessarily. Right. Um, I want to get to some questions that are very specifically about the book, which is fantastic. Uh, one actually relates directly to that. Brad Smith in May 2019, per page 87, led <laughs> to the... This is typed, too. I mean, this is, like, professional. This is very impressive. Uh, led Carol Ann, great job. <laughs> <laughs> led Just to the kidding. launch of Election Guard, an encrypted voting yeah. system that protects individual ballots and yeah. their collective tallies. Can the tech industry help support the cost of replacing, and maybe I'm gonna add, uh, lobby for the policy that would lead to replacing old voting systems with any version that meets the standards outlined in the book. Um, yeah, the first thing I'll briefly do is explain Election Guard, which is a new system that we devised and are open sourcing, among other things, so that anybody can use it and different uh, hardware companies, including companies that make voting systems, can use it. And what it really does is combine old and new technology. So you basically would go to the polls, you go step into the voting booth, you would choose your, your candidates, for example, on a, on a touch screen, a smart screen, and, you, and then it would actually print out a paper ballot that just has your choices. And you'd say, oh yeah, those are my choices. You would drop the paper ballot in the, the box and you have a secure paper record. It would do one other thing too. It would print out, in effect, a receipt that would have an alphanumeric code that is, uh, in, in effect, a code that is unique to your ballot. And then in the future, if you ever had any, a question about whether your vote was counted and counted accurately, you could go online and you would see you know, if your vote is there and if it has the same code that you have. So it prevents tampering, it ensures security. Um, I think it's a good thing. You know, can tech companies help pay for the cost of this? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we're actually underwriting certain costs, but mostly I, I, I would argue that the healthy thing for a democracy is to do what we've always done in, in a democracy. Um, let's not privatize, you know, who's going to pay for the voting system. Let's have the public pay for the voting system, in my view. It is affordable, especially when you think about the consequences of things going awry. Uh, and, you know, we need a certain level of federal spending, which we are advocating for. And to answer the, uh, the last part of this, yes, I believe we should you be using our voice in part to inform people about the dangers that we currently face, but in part to be a voice for bipartisan action to ensure what I think is a, absolutely a bipartisan or nonpartisan cause, which is integrity in voting. Mm -hmm. um, I love these specific book questions. Page 283. <laughs> Congress, in I mean, good job, guys. You yeah. See me later about prepping me for interviews. <laughs> um, Congress in 2014 passed the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. President Obama built on this in 2016, open data for AI, uh, and the Trump administration proposed an integrated federal data strategy. You talk about open data requirements uh, later in the book. Could you update on what has happened in 2019 and also talk about what you say in the book and with respect to the need for open data? Um, you know, well, the first thing I would say is the good news is we basically, you know, had the opportunity to edit the book until about July. So, uh, you know, we captured most of the developments on this. And, and, and what I'd step back and, and do is just try to talk a little bit about what the concept is. I actually think it's one of the most important concepts in the book, especially in terms of its global impact. The basic notion is let's start with AI. It is the combustion engine of the future. Combustion engine runs on gasoline, AI runs on data. That's a simple way to think about it. But in some ways, it's even more important than that because the whole key to perfecting AI is to feed in larger amounts of data. That is what is used to train models. As we sort of say in the book, we've never met a data scientist who says, I don't need any more data. They always want more data because it will make their AI better. So what does that mean for the world? Well, the real challenge is that if you're a smaller company or a smaller community or a smaller country, you may not have access to as much data. And if that is the reality, 
then the terms of competition in an AI-dominated era are going to favor the biggest players. The biggest players are going to be the biggest countries. That argues for China with 1.4 billion people because they will, over time, create four times as much data as the United States with 320 million people. It will favor the biggest companies. And the greatest danger, actually, we would say, is it will favor the biggest tech companies that will be in the best position to aggregate data. So what's the antidote? Well, the antidote is to level the playing field. And there are two ways, simply put, I think, to level the playing field. The first is to enable everybody who has smaller data sets, in effect, to share data. Not to surrender control or ownership, but there are certain technology techniques that we describe and certain rules that can help that will enable entities to get the benefits of scale by sharing and pooling data. And we're starting to see real interest in this. I, we were very struck. We were in Europe last month. And what's really interesting is when people start you know, coming to you and they're making your argument to you. And I have no idea whether it was because of the impact of our book, but it is encouraging to see. And the other part, yes. yeah. And the other part, and this really speaks to the, the person who wrote the question, is you get the government to take public data sets, data sets that are not um, sensitive from a privacy standpoint, and put them in the public domain on terms that anybody can use. That's the other way you level the playing field. And so to answer the question, interest in this is growing. In Europe, there is real movement in terms of new government initiatives. In the United States, there's growing interest, but I, I think there's probably been less movement in the United States in 2019 than there has been in, in, in Europe. Um, I actually want to interject quickly with a question of my own, which is about, uh, as this conversation about regulation or the rules continues, there has been pushback from Mark Zuckerberg, uh, who has essentially said, look, if we don't innovate, if there are burdensome regulations placed on us and we do not innovate, then China will. And arguably, China is the only place right now incubating actual competition to the United States tech industry without many shackles. How do you see that developing? Well, I think we really um, need to consider three things. First, we do need to innovate, embrace the goal. Second, now let's ask how we innovate and I think it is an imperative on the United States, in part because of this data issue uh, and the imbalance, I'll say, with China, to really create, I'll just say, an alliance for the 21st century that brings together North America and Western Europe, South Korea, Japan, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, perhaps India, so that we're innovating together. And if we have that kind of scale, then we know we have the power to innovate, but then let's innovate in a way that protects human rights, that preserves privacy. We can afford to put in place the fundamental infrastructure that will give the public confidence in sharing data. And I think that's the right recipe. So, you know, I, I share this notion that's a factor we need to consider, but I believe there is a path, and it's a really important path for this country to think about. We have reached the point in the program where there is time for only one question. Uh, most of the remaining questions are big and hairy and very well thought out. So I'm going to go with one of my own, which is... <laughs> <laughs> because there are two minutes left. I'm in radio, people. In the whole 15 topics, where is quantum computing? Huh. A really interesting point, because I, I think if you do a search for the word quantum, you probably won't find it in, in the book. Um, I do think as we look to the decade... You guys are working on that, though, at Microsoft. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I know, I do think in the decade ahead it will become increasingly important. And, and it, we're, we're already seeing it in one respect, and we'll see it in a, in a second uh, respect as well. You know, in the first respect, we're already actually seeing quantum computing techniques. Mm -hmm. And because of the power of the cloud, basically so-called classical computing and the ability to connect so many servers together... You know, we're already seeing you know, you know, computational you know, problems that you, we would look to with quantum-based solutions being pursued. But the real question is, hey, you know, w w when do I get to use a quantum computer for real? I think the real question is, when you talk about a tool versus a weapon, 
Quantum is getting a reputation as a pretty terrifying weapon if encryption goes away. Not to yeah, prolong no, it, our conversation. No, it, it, it's a fair question. I, uh, and I would say two things. the next book. No, I, I would say, look, in the, in the 2020s, you know, we're going to see, you know, quantum computing start to come to life for certain problems. You know, basically huge computational problems. That's where it will be used, including, as you say, to break encryption or to create stronger encryption. But where I think we should be most excited about it being used is to take on some of the enormous data challenges that we're going to need to break through in order to address sustainability issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll just close by saying, you know, if you ask me, what will be the most important technology policy issue of the 2020s? I'll argue it'll be sustainability just because I think it's going to be the most important issue for almost every field in the 2020s. And, you know, for technology, part of it means addressing our environmental footprint. But the really exciting thing is to ask, how do we use digital technology to help address, to break through, uh, to advance solutions, especially to, you know, really try to make, uh, you know, reductions in the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere and in the oceans. Quantum computing has the potential to have a positive impact. You know, so it will unleash a lot of new challenges. It will enable a lot of new solutions. Just think about it as, in some ways, a continuation of everything we've seen over the last decade, but now times 10 or 100 or, or more in terms of a potential impact. Next book for sure. Our thanks to Brad Smith, president of Microsoft and author of the new book, Tools and Weapons. Thank you. Thank you. The Promise and Peril of the digital age. And I want to remind you before you go, copies uh, of Mr. Smith's book are for sale. Both he and his co-author, Carol Ann Brown, are here, and they will sign copies on stage following the program. I am Molly Wood, and this Commonwealth Club program is adjourned. <laughs>